Hello everyone and welcome to the latest of our short course, Curating Art and Culture in a Digital Age. My name is Malcolm McNeil and I am the Director of the Postgraduate Diploma in Asian Art here at SOAS. And I'm delighted to be welcoming you to this fourth session in our series of five, um, co-produced between the Postgraduate Diploma in Asian Art and SIMS, the Centre for the Creative Industry, Media and Screen Studies here at SOAS, where we've been working with my colleague, Dr. Casper Melville, who's led the first three sessions of, of this, this programme for us so far. So today uh, we'll be speaking about uh, cur curating, collecting and uh, creating digital art. And we have a wonderful panel here to join us that I'll introduce you to in just a moment. Um, so today's topic is really building on what we've been looking at earlier in this programme, thinking about social media and its interaction with our daily lives, thinking about music production, and thinking also about film and, uh, and its relationship with the digital. So here today we're moving more into what might be termed the fine arts, the, um, the kind of the, the spaces of the gallery, the museum, uh, the commercial art fair, and indeed the many kind of site specific installations that digital artists work in. So now I'd like to welcome the wonderful panel that we've assembled for you today, a group of curators, gallerists, and practicing artists and educators who are going to come together to discuss these core themes around how we interact with the digital in an artistic space in uh, 2021. So our first um, panelist today is Calvin Hui. Um, who is the co-founder of 3812 Gallery in Hong Kong, uh, which also has a premises in London, um, and also the founder and, um, and director of um, Inc. Asia uh, Art Fair and Inc. Now, uh, amongst a number of other cultural uh, projects. Really, Calvin is a cultural entrepreneur who is advocating for um, Inc. Art as a, a form of contemporary artistic expression originating in East Asian culture, so kind of decentering perhaps our, our approach to the art world in, um, in the context of um, uh, of the 21st century art market and uh, art fair curation. So Kelvin, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Our next panelist is Dr. Yi Yun Kang, who joins us today from Seoul, but who is um, normally resident in, in London um, as a visiting lecturer at the Royal College of Art. Um, she's a practicing digital artist um, who I had the pleasure to work with some years ago when she uh, was a, a resident artist at the VNA, um, producing a work known as Casting that perhaps she may touch on later, although maybe we'll be hearing more about her, her later developments and more, more up-to-date work in her career. Um, so she, as I said, is a, is a lecturer, a visiting lecturer at the RCA, specializing in information experience design, but crucially also a practicing artist who can give us insights into uh, uh, both the process and the, the reception of, of uh, digital art in a 21st century context. Our third panellist is Adrian Locke, who joins us again from London, um, and he is the chief curator of the Royal Academy. So we're thrilled to have him here representing one of the, the major cultural institutions of London and speaking to how within a perhaps a more um, a holistic overview of curatorial practice, at least in, in the London context, digital fits into the, the wider concerns of, of an institution such as the RA. So Adrian, thank you very much for being here with us today. And our fourth panellist is Victor Wong. Um, who is a, a practicing ink and AI artist represented by Cal Calvin Hui's 3812 gallery. He joins us um, from Hong Kong and is, um, he sits really at an intersection between many of the elements of the, uh, the course that we, uh, of our course that we have been discussing. He's um, uh, currently, as I said, a practicing ink and artificial intelligence artist, but also has a background in the digital design of both um, uh, film and, um, and computer games. So really sits at that kind of intersection between different elements of the digital world and shows how they can be brought together in, um, in exemplified in his creative practice. So thank you all very much for joining us. We're thrilled to have you here. And I'm so excited to hear what you have to say about your various experiences of and approaches to um, creating, curating and collecting digital art. So I want to open with a question addressed to all of you, a kind of a, a, a soft opener, if you will, just to, to hear a bit more about your practice and how it intersects with the digital. So if you can tell us something of, of, of that uh, in, in just a few minutes, um, let's start with, um, uh, with Yi Yun, if you would like to, to, to go first. Thanks a lot for having me today and thanks again a lot for the introduction. Yes, I am an uh, Yun Kang, I'm a visiting lecturer at the RCA, but love to be introduced as an artist. So today I'm going to share, I'm just going to show you five minutes long, except of my latest installations that happens in the last two years, mostly except for one project at the VNA, which is the first video that I'll show you. So um, before I share the screen, uh, you will find that my work is about exploring boundaries 
So through work, I attempt to disrupt the opposition between a variety of concepts such as materiality, immateriality, reality, virtuality, presence, absence, surface, and depth, analog, digital. So, and through that, I love to engender perceptual ambiguity in leading the audience to reflect on this dichotomy. So in my work, you will see that I use hybrid moving image, which is mixture of digital film and motion graphics and wrap them onto the three-dimensional architecture surfaces. So lots of technologies such as projection mapping, modeling, physical computing, coding AI, and et cetera, and they are needed to complete a project. So they are mostly large scale installation. Some of them are very site specific. Some of them are object specific and context specific. And for me, soundscape is also very important. So as a result, I produce special temporal immersive experiential installations.
So as you can see, I use special projection mapping installations, large scale LED displays. Sometimes I work with architects, performers, musicians, and um, engineers in order to complete a single project. So for me, making an environmental moving image that generates people's you know, active involvement, bodily engagement is the most important thing. So I hope that I could detail my project that I share you now throughout today's session. So this is me. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I mean, as, as far as it can be in the kind of format of a screen, immersive introduction to your work and that, that very clear and succinct kind of framing of the, the technologies, the, um, uh, the interfaces that you use both in creating this and, and also the, um, the way that you, you, you intend it to be received and perceived. So well, I really look forward to talking more about uh, that with you in a second, the, the kind of the process of reception, the relationship to a body, since you are kind of physical, organic interaction with these um, essentially intangible, digital, immersive experiences that you create. So we'll, we'll come back to that in, in a short moment. But I'd now like to, to go on to, um, to invite um, uh, Calvin to join us, to tell us a little bit about his, um, his work and to answer that opening question, how does your practice uh, as a curator and a gallerist interact with the digital? Calvin, over to you. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Soa. Hi, everyone. I'm Calvin Hoy. Well, uh, when talking about creating uh, exhibitions or creating art projects in this digital age, um, since I have different roles in the art market, so I have a gallery 3812 in Hong Kong and London, and I also do art consultancy. Recently, actually, I'm now in Macau um, being quarantined in a hotel room, so you can see, um, because I'm going to also create a big project um, for MGM Kotai, the chairman's collection exhibition. And at the same time, as Malcolm said, uh, I have the Ink Now art platform, uh, which specializes in contemporary ink art uh, globally. Um, so, so actually, that these different platforms, um, I always um, ask myself uh, how we uh, communicate with the audience, which means uh, I have to define the target audience. And now, these two two years, um, because of the pandemic, uh, we uh, mostly stay in our own place, um, also cannot travel. But uh, at the same time, I also have different um, exhibitions and projects around the world. Um, for example, last year, um, our master artist Xiao Qing um, in Morocco Art Centre, um, he has a solo exhibition. And we have our London Gallery exhibitions. And recently, um, I also uh, co-curated the uh, uh, Song Museum Xiao Qing's uh, exhibition in Beijing. Uh, but um, thanks to the technology, thanks to this uh, digital um, era, uh, we have um, we have the ability uh, to work with different parties and also communicate with the audience. Um, as I said, um, now when we define our target audience, um, for example, in, in, in the gallery aspect, um, we communicate with the co collectors mostly. So we have to enhance the appreciation, um, the, the, the way they appreciate their artwork. And for example, in Macau, that would be like in a big public area in a hotel premises. So the artworks and the audience, actually, I would, I, I would call it like public engagement. And in a museum, it's more like academic and more uh, um, from the, from, from the we're really like we want to create the, 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 the environment that uh, allow the, the, art, uh, the, the artist um, works um, very well presented to the audience, both at academically, but at the same time also to how to also um, uh, invite the audience to trigger their imaginations through the exhibitions. So therefore, therefore, I would say uh, in, in, in this digital age, um, both technology and to me, technology and social. So these two, two, two aspects, um, we can make use uh, of the technology to enhance um, enhance the viewer to appreciate um, the artwork, to appreciate the exhibitions. 
and also to interact with them. And in, in the social side, uh, because of the technology, we have social media like Instagram, Facebook, and WeChat. So um, uh, nowadays, and especially these two years, I, I always want to focus on these two years because everyone cannot travel. So they can use their digital device, their phone, to, to learn about um, the, art, uh, the happenings in the art world, to receive the information from us um, about our artists and exhibitions. Uh, so, so, so this this is um, the period that we, as a conventional gallerist, or we build a conventional like art fair platform, we begin to understand the benefit of um, using technology um, or using digital device to uh, communicate with the audience. Um, Therefore, I, I, I found I found very inspiring, and also there are many imagination space here. Um, after the pandemic, when everyone can resume travel, resume norm normality, how this physical experience and the digital experience can combine together to enhance. Uh, I, I think I think these two areas can hold hand um, together, and then to maximize the um, the, the impact in terms of uh, artistic presentation and also marketing promotions and etc um, on the other on the other hand um, as malcolm also introduced me uh, i'm more specialized in contemporary ink art and also 20th century modern art and also contemporary art um, i had a notion called uh, eastern origin and contemporary expression um, because i believe um, through also uh, using t the technology, we can renew the perception or re rediscover um, something that maybe we haven't had the experience to understand deeply, but through digital, um, uh, through technology, we could also discover um, some new ideas and also the new elements in, in a traditional medium like in art. That's why when I started to work with Victor Wong, um, that two three years ago we launched Tang together, and then we also launched the um, the world's first artificial intelligence ink artist uh, through the Ink Now platform in Taipei and Shanghai, and then we had an exhibition in our London gallery, which actually received uh, a lot of like um, positive feedback and also some questions and also some uh, very inspiring uh, comments. That that's why um, I always think in this digi digital age, when we create um, art exhibitions, uh, it's not just now about how you present the art on the wall or in the, in the physical space, but at the same time, we can also consider how can um, maximize this imagination through the digital um, application as well. Thank you very much. Calvin, thank you so much. And I, I love your... Um... Your, your kind of analogy there of the, the digital and the physical kind of hand in hand with one another um, and that real focus on the diversity of platforms that you've you've used both for engagement with the art remotely um, but also to kind of to promote it that you know that core aspect of of the consumption of art that we we are bombarded with so much information so the digital is also kind of coming very much into our personal spaces and, and drawing us in to interact with arts uh, artworks that are both physical and, and digital. Um, and really the kind of the digital has supplanted the physical for so many of us over the past 16 months or so. Um, and with your kind of uh, final comment there, framing um, and introducing Victor's work, I'd like to hand over to, to Victor Wong to ask him to speak a little bit about how his current artistic practice interacts with the digital, and perhaps to give us some background on, on how he came to this, um, this Tech Inc project, uh, which you've pioneered with, with support from Calvin. Victor, thank you for joining us and over to you. Yes. Well, um, thank you very much uh, to have me here. Um, and then um, I, my name is Victor Wong. Um, I actually introduced myself as a digital artist for, uh, way back in the 90s. So I could have used computer as a tools to create my artwork uh, for movies, for advertising, and now for in art for almost like 30 years. So it's very natural for me to think in a digital way to create artwork. And uh, I would like to share some of the work um, and I will talk about that. So um, this is some of the artwork um, that I've been doing in, um, in the past um, few years um, about the ink. Yeah. I'll say this um, 
tech and era because uh, it's like technology plus in together. So what we can do? So this is my some of the work um, I've been doing. Uh, it is uh, about like uh, what is this? 20, Two thousand years of our work, like ink art uh, in China. Um, how do we um, um, appreciate it in the twenty first century? I think um, uh, because of my uh, backgrounds, I think and work as a using computer. So I'm I'm thinking of how to make it as a tools and then and then um, uh, put uh, ink. Uh, this kind of art into a form that uh, we can experience, uh, not just uh, 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 using ink and paper, can it be uh, inside a virtual space, or even after we paint it, can we uh, output it in a, in a different format, like a 3D printing, or even uh, if, if, let's say, if I would like to collaborate with an uh, artist, um, I would like to collaborate with an AI. So what will be that come up with? So this is um, somehow I've been thinking, I've been working of how this physical, um, digital, mental, how to put it all together in a nutshell. So um, uh, let's see another work that inspired me of doing uh, this. This is a um, um, video that I created uh, with uh, Hong Kong Jockey Club about to transform uh, a like 100 years old in paintings, uh, uh, horses. Uh, of, a, of a very famous uh, Chinese ink painter. So to convert that into a new, a new form of um, uh, maybe animations, uh, maybe some kind of um, three-dimensional AR kind of thing. But um, uh, what will be what what will be looking? So uh, so this is somehow I try to convert to to put in the context that um, uh, it is to create that two D pieces into a three D world. So this is it.
年，马腾盛世，飞跃新里程。农历新年赛马日，大年初三，沙田马场。So, um, um, I think it,、uh, um, is that when we go digital, when we think, um, using a, a computer or digital machines as a as a tool, there are a lot of things we can put in. Uh, for example, the animations, or even three dimension, a created world, and you can put a camera in it and then follow your artwork. So this is something very interesting, and for an artist to、uh, just look like we have a, one more dimensions、um, to create、uh, artwork for ourselves. So、um, and and also I think about、uh, physical, digital. What is the contrast between it?、Um, how do we treat it? Is it is it、um, Uh, virtually, or is it real? Is it real or virtual? I, I don't think it's, it doesn't matter. I think it, it it can be put together, or even it, it can put in the opposite way、uh, and contrast each other. So I create another piece that is、um, this. This is、um, a piece uh, with um, a uh, inside is a big screen, LED screen, and I create a 3D in well inside it. And also I created. Um, and other、uh, physical metal pieces around it to surround it, and and then put a contrast, and then it put in a context, and then uh, people's uh, or audience can、um, look around it, think about it, or, or even touch it.、Um, you can touch the physical、um, sculpture, but can you touch your、uh, the virtual world, or maybe you can feel it? So this is um, um, the、uh, the work, and then.、Um, I put a very little pieces that、uh, you can take a look of the,、um, the size of this、um, uh, of what I call sculpture,、uh, but it's not exactly close、uh, sculpture. It's it's a container, contain、um, uh, a digital world and physical world. Okay, so、um, uh, then I、um, after I, I create um,、uh, a, like a put put ink and and tag together. I think what 3D tag and ink can put together, and then to have like a from some new look, new form. But what if I have a Um, uh, a, a, a partner that can, can create some artwork for me together. So I'm think of、uh, what is the collaboration between human and machine? What it will be? Um, uh, I think uh, uh, if if this AI, if my partners can create any paintings, that would be well, wonderful. So I'm kind of think about what、uh, and how. So、um, the what is like AI ink painting, and the how is that how to、uh, achieve that.、Um, Artwork. So I'm thinking about、um, uh, the art,、uh, the practice of ink paintings of ourselves, like Chinese.、Uh, in, Ch in in ancient China, we we not actually live draw the mountains. Sometimes we will like go around traveling and then、uh, go back to our our studio or home and then、um, uh, let her have a piece of rice paper and some ink and then draw a.、Uh, The imagination or the、uh, the、um, the memory. I will call it mindscape. So it's kind of The Chinese ink painting is some kind of drawing your the mindscape inside your brain. So this is somehow the practice. So I would like the AIs to to start from there. So、um, what I say, okay, I need a I need a a, a body for my AI because、um, he's going to practice the ink painting. So what I do is that、um, I try to、um, I try to teach、um, the AI the very fundamental、um, things like、uh, using ink and then.、Um, Uh, with the pressure,、uh, different pressure, you can have a narrow lines or thick lines, and base this is just like a child, and then you just teach the child or AI to use the, some fundamental basic things, and then from there, and ask the AIs to create a landscape based on parameters of the like temperature, pressures,、um, or even like a、uh, like a like a con,、uh, like how the how the earth form a for,、uh, form a landscape. So、uh, every time Gemini is、uh, before his paint, he will in his mind create a landscape based on the、uh, parameters,、uh, which is like、um, the time,、uh, the temperature and humidity of the day, 
and then create landscape from there. And from there, you would start painting, uh, live draw the paint. So the, um, the, um, um, the result is something like this. So um, kind of uh, like us. So um, in, in this AI mind, um, he would travel through his 3D landscape, just like us. Go to the landscape and take pictures. But uh, he's not taking pictures. He's just live draw what he saw in his AI's mind. So this is somehow, um, I think it, it, it is some kind of um, a robot uh, create a digital artwork, but it's not digital. It is physical. I think it is it is it's quite nice. And uh, so um, and I and I start with uh, like joining with like um, um, uh, Kelvin. How do we promote uh, this kind of artwork uh, in paintings in the twenty first century uh, to the world? And I think uh, we oh let's do the exhibitions. Uh, let's um, uh, talk about this. Let's find someone which is like, um, for example, Cafe Pacific. Uh, they can um, showcase um, or interview and then put into the infrared magazine so more, more people uh, can uh, know about it. And then also we even, we even um, uh, asked uh, Samsung as a collaboration that like, uh, ink painting and Samsung, the screen can be do a collaboration together or promotions. And let's start from there. Uh, and also um, we do exhibition around the world uh, now in London. Uh, I try to uh, put uh, the, uh, the because um, I, I try to connect uh, people in the West uh, about, uh, to Chinese ink painting. I, I, I try to contact itself is like familiar with them. So I, fi I, I found uh, like, a, like a moon uh, to draw the moon using the AI so that uh, uh, the, peop uh, the audience or visitor knows what the contact is. And then this is the moon. And uh, I remember that uh, when I go interview from the BBC, the, the reporters just rush in the, um, um, the gallery and say, oh, this is the moonscape. And you know, this moonscape connected uh, the, the ink painting to the West because they know the context and then they know, oh, is the, if it is the ink, this kind of old techniques, but use, use the, a new, new I, can, I cannot say it's a formation, it's like a, a process like the, the AI create the landscape and then live draw the landscape using the, the traditional ink and paper and paint paper and and ink to create artwork. This is digital created, but but is not digital. <laughs> so this is somehow a very um, a funny ways to describe. And then, and then because of that, I got like a lot of tensions of different media and uh, and also because it's drawn by AI and robots. Um, uh, that will create um, a debate. What will be the copyrights? What, uh, how is you price it? And uh, there's a lot of things that um, uh, go on discussions. I think, I think that is, is something this good in the digital age is that we create something that's not in, uh, 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 existed before. And then we have uh, different ideas and perspective and debates over it. So this is somehow a, a good thing. Um, to do art, I, I think this is uh, this is our age now. Uh, so um, this is another um, uh, some of the paintings, and we collaborate with with, uh, with different uh, corporate and uh, and have exhibition, physical, uh, 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 digital, and then also we even have like a seminar and to talk about that. And people start thinking what AI can do more, or even how's the collaboration between humans? How how's the difference between that? And I would say, um, uh, without the AI, I cannot draw the pictures like that. And AI without me, um, he, he itself cannot draw a pictures like that. So it's a, it's a totally collaborations um, between us. So um, this is um, somehow I, I try to open up a, a question. Uh, is it art? Victor, thank you so much for the, the very uh, comprehensive introduction to your work and, and your background with a, a real range of projects. I mean, two, two particular things you said that I, I, I want to come back to you later, um, that you opened by talking about thinking in a digital way um, and that that's very intuitive for you. That's something I want to hold on to and we'll, we'll, we'll return to you later when we perhaps think more about the, the creative processes that underpin your work and Yi Yun's work. Um, and you also commented thank that you... you um, uh, the, that the AI live draws what the AI sees in its own mind. So I think perhaps we can come back to that as well and start unpacking how artificial intelligence perceives and what, what constitute the spaces that you are representing as well as the spaces you're presenting these works in. So that kind of 
that notion of kind of different kinds of cognition that underpin your, your work are, are really stimulating, exciting, and very much new territory for me, at least. Um, but now I'd like to hand over to our, our panelist, um, Adrian Locke, and ask him to give us perhaps a bit of an introduction to how an institution like the RA and, um, and, and your work there as a curator, Adrian, intersects with the digital. What are perhaps the, the challenges or even the opportunities that these various new formats, media, um, material and immaterial contexts of, um, of production, um, how do they intersect with an august institution like the RA that's now celebrating more than two and a half centuries of, of kind of presence in central London, shaping the art scene here? Well, uh, indeed, that's a, a, a big question, isn't it? Thank you, um, Malcolm, for both inviting me to, to speak and for introducing me. Um, thinking about this webinar and thinking about what we've just seen and um, the, the experience that I've had over the last 20 years working at the Royal Academy, which for those of you who don't know is a, a central London um, institution. It's a private institution um, which has a various um, different aspects to it but the primary work that I do is on temporary exhibitions we have three different gallery spaces and I sort of realized thinking about this that we've been working with digital art in different ways uh, for quite a long time in fact since uh, the first exhibition I worked on in 2001 which was on Aztecs when we we used um, what I think we would now call virtual reality um, to recreate a sense of the Great Pyramid in Tenochtitlan, the capital of the uh, Aztecs, and that was that was kind of very exhilarating and very exciting. And uh, uh, the the one um, drawback with it was, I suppose, the, the 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 issue of how far you can go with the technology and how much money you have. So I think that one of the prime considerations always with digital, especially as we're seeing with the incredible kind of advances in technology, um, is how a gallery like the Royal Academy can keep pace and how it can also integrate digital work um, into its exhibitions uh, in a meaningful way without actually kind of um, spending vast sums of money, which is our experience to date has been the digital art is actually quite an expensive um, component of an exhibition rather depending of course on what you um how you define digital and i'm just showing you now some images of our current exhibition david hockney the arrival of spring and you can see in the top uh, image there a, a bank of these um paintings uh, hung in the main uh, in gallery three in our main galleries and three individual works uh, and what's fascinating about these of course is and probably no surprise to you um, that David Hockney has been drawing on iPads for quite a long time and these are actual um, digital kind of drawings they they, they are um, they have the mechanical process of of his hand uh, interacting with the screen which then um, creates and then and develops these digital print so you know we, we can talk about digital and be in quite a conventional way as in um, David's work uh, and presented very much in a conventional way uh, as you would imagine walking into an, uh, an art gallery in like the National Gallery for example and seeing paintings on the wall um, and uh, but then we can also talk about completely different experiences in which um, uh, augmented experience or artificial intelligence or uh, virtual reality all these different elements can be used in quite uh, different and challenging ways as in Marina Abramovich's performance piece The Life uh, at the Serpentine another gallery in London uh, where she wasn't actually uh, present um, but what what the visitor uh, the experience the visitor had uh, was um, witnessing standing in that in that room you can see in the bottom slide there uh, with headsets on, looking at Marina um, in the middle of the room, uh, enacting the performance, which you can see her recording here, um, and other images. And this, the, the the actual experience of seeing Marina in the gallery was just part of the whole um, performance in itself. The, the the way that you entered the gallery, the way that you interacted with the, you can see the individuals in the white coats there, the sort of lab technicians who dealt with you and so on and so forth. So it was a kind of theatrical piece. Uh, more recently, we commissioned uh, Yinka Shinabare um, to, to uh, 
transform one of his sculptures into a kind of virtual reality experience, something that we worked with a company called Happy Finish with as part of an exhibition we did from life. Um, and it was a very interesting and very valuable kind of learning curve um, about um, working with VR. Uh, and it, although there are limitless possibilities with VR, there are also some very practical hands-on kind of complications and challenges that the gallery with a paying audience and uh, has to sort of manage. And that's something perhaps we can talk about uh, in very similar ways that the uh, Modigliani show at the Tate Modern in 2018 also had a section given over to, to VR, which was uh, produced for them by a company called Preloaded. Um, so as you can sort of see from, from the slides that I'm showing you very briefly, um, is that we don't have that technology, we don't have that capability in-house, and I, I doubt for whether any of the, our you know, colleagues and museums and institutions in London also have that technology. So it is something that we need to look externally for. So it, that the, the idea of working with digital um, presents many, many challenges. Obviously, we've seen um, that the amazing creative process and what it delivers. Um, but for, for a gallery like ours, um, the challenges of working with digital, is maybe something we can talk about a bit later, um, are, are very considerable. Um, and it doesn't mean to say that we don't want to embrace and work with digital, not at all. Um, it's just how we, we find a way to, to do that comfortably um, and in, in, a, in a meaningful way, I think, which is the biggest challenge for us. But once again, I just want to reiterate, I think that when we start thinking about it, digital the digital life and the digital world has been with us for quite a long time we, we and, and and it's the developments and the way that artists and um gamers and other people who work with this material are advancing the technology um that's really um i i suppose we're, we're kind of playing catch up a bit in an institution like the royal academy trying to understand how best to incorporate adapt and work with artists who work with um in digital art so I'll leave it there, Malcolm, I think. Adrian, thank you very much. Um, I think that really provocatively and, and helpfully positions us for the kind of next next set of questions I wanted to ask you. You posited yourself that there is something of an ambiguity or, or difficulty, I suppose, in defining what constitutes digital art, what this means in the various different contexts we've seen, whether it's the kind of the commercial um, gallery spaces that Calvin manages and creates, whether it's the kind of the interaction with traditional media and materials that Victor is experimenting with, with AI and, and, and mechanized robotic arm, or whether it's the kind of the, the more immersive interaction interactive installation pieces that Yoon was speaking about so uh, and indeed your your examples from the RA as well all of these are kind of they share something in common but but seem to take a slightly different slant on on what constitutes the digital so I'd kind of like to throw another question out to the to the whole panel um for, for a short um, and pithy um or at least a, a request for as, as short and pithy as possible an answer you might give to how you would define digital art what does it does it have specific boundaries and does it need to have those specific boundaries perhaps we can start again with with you and if we invite you back in as you um, you opened so kindly for us a few um a few minutes ago so you and back to you um for me so oh sorry let me just ask the question one more time so um is so that the yeah. questions about the definitions of digital arts yeah. or what does it, what does digital mean to me mm. as a practitioner well, it's a, it's, I'm, I thank you very much for taking upon my question and throwing it back i think that that is a much better question and I, why don't you answer both of those so i i had asked you you know okay. how can we define should we define and how would you define digital art but let's take your your response you know what what does it what does it mean and what does it mean to you as a practitioner and, and mm -hmm. maybe you can give us something on those what, what the difference is between those two Mm -hmm. Okay, so for me, the first question, what can we define digital art? That is kind of a long term question to every, let's say, digital practitioner. So, you know, the, we don't even yet define, we don't even have a definite term for it. Some, somebody calls it media art, somebody calls it new media art, somebody calls it like digital art. So, uh, well, but frankly, to be honest, as a practitioner, about a decade ago, when I first started to use actively start to incorporate digital technologies in my work, I thought that we should, you know, define it. We have to separate digital arts 
from the other, you know, conventional medium or whatnot. But these days, I kind of shifting my thoughts from there to here, which is, should we, I mean, for example, if a painter, the theme of a painting is heavily drawn by digital topic, for example, if a painter draws something about the AI, should we define it as a digital art or a painting? So, well, the my answer to the first question is, Probably, I don't know yet. I'm still figuring it out as a, as a practitioner. Um, I used to have a, of an answer, but not now. And what does digital to me um, as a practitioner and as a lecturer and as a researcher, the so digital is medium to me. It is not just technical, but conceptual and critical medium because I myself, I shifted from a painter. I trained as a pain painter for a long time. And then I started to use video and now I'm using pretty much digital. So that particular transition hugely influenced my body of work. So I value the differences and I also find that understanding the difference is very important. So what I mean here by difference includes literally everything the materiality, the theory, the philosophy, the practicality, you know, everything. So that's the reason why I decided to do my PhD in, you know, environmental moving image, projection mapping, what is screen, what is digital, because I wanted to have a deeper and better understanding about this medium. So for me, acknowledging the differences, similarities, or the overlapping areas between digital and physical plays a significant role in my whole practice. So I think as a, as a practitioner, I have to be the mediator between digital, physical, my concept and the real installation from bits, bytes to the reality, the actuality. So yeah, that is digital. Thank you very me. much. Um, can I can I ask a follow up question to you then, Yuyun, before we, we move on to the rest of the panel? You you talked about your your original training, and I, I think in a way that that kind of mediating that you describe between bits and bytes and the physical reality, mm -hmm. it, so that we can envisage your your process a bit more. If we were to walk into your studio, what would we see? Would we see banks of computers and code and cables? Do you have do you sketch things in in, in hard copy material? The, this materiality mm -hmm. and immateriality seems at the core of the the tensions you're describing for us. So can you maybe walk us through? what we would see if we were in the space in which you make the works that you've shown to us. Yeah, so if you remember my first, the, the first project at the video, which is like a projection on top of the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum's huge sculptures, it's called casting. Uh, as a VNA resident artist, I was asked to select one of the existing collections of the VNA and make our own reinterpretations about it. So I, I studied a lot about the museum because museum itself is really physical, material, small, big, you know, the objects. But my work on the country is pretty much about immaterial beams of lights, projected lights and moving images that only exist within my computer before I render it and, and project it through the computer. So, but then I figure that, you know, the, 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 the cast courts, the, uh, the gallery within the VNA is actually, it's a big, gallery, gigantic gallery for to store the cast, not the original sculpture. So well, well, but okay, so let me, but I am, if, if you come to my studio, actually, what you will see is pretty much the computers and projectors and, you know, little boards and all of that. But all of the process throughout the process from the initialization, the ideation towards the final exhibition, I do a lot of different experimentation. It, it includes not just digital rendering, but it includes from the writing research, but even I make a physical models and I physical drawings in order to co connect little dots. So many, there's so many dots, so I have to connect them in order to make my work cohesive intangible so yes so that's i would say that my work is i generate spatial narrative not just temporal narrative but it's sculptural painting it's um onto three-dimensional surface so it's all about the i love to make some tensions between these two opposite qualities so that is the yeah if you Again, if you come to my studio, there will be there will be also small drawings and 
physical models. <laughs> Thank you. So I, yeah, I think that that implicit tension, that continuous unresolved tension between the um, the physical and the the digital, the material and the immaterial, something that you know, it's, it's great to hear more about your your process and how that plays out in the in the route that leads to those finished works that you showed us. Um, so I'd like to turn now to um, uh, to Calvin again to ask, you know, as a as a gallerist, as someone who is not only um, forming his own definitions. You, you have a very active role, Calvin, in, in your art fairs and the presentation of work by artists such as Victor in shaping other people's conceptions of, of what constitutes digital art. So kind of with that in mind that you are, you know, to use the kind of social media parlance, not only a, a kind of a, a consumer, but also an influencer of others. How, how do you define digital art in your practice as a, as a curator and a gallerist? And is such a definition useful? Yeah, um, because I actually not really involved into a lot of like digital art curation. So like um, in our gallery or in art fair, we, we engage with more uh, traditional artists. I mean, conventional artists or uh, Victor is, the, is, a, is a unique one that uh, I work with because uh, he, his work is like half human and half uh, digital. <laughs> and then uh, to, me, to, me, um, to me, digital is giving a new dimension as a new life um, to 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 I mean to the existing world. I will give you an example. Like um, in Song Museum uh, in Beijing, so I created um, an exhibition for Xiao Qing uh, with Philip Dodd. Uh, so uh, Xiao Qing is like an eighty-six years old um, artist. Um, we now uh, call him like a post war Asian uh, abstract master. Um, who lived in Milan. So uh, we selected uh, a collection of his 1960s work uh, in, a, in, a, in a theme of the universe and energy. So at that time when he created this work is um, he used acrylic. At that time acrylic is quite a new medium and um, he applied very vibrant colors. And then he also had uh, a lot of like geometrical symbols and, and, and structures and influenced by op art as well. So um, in, in the Song Museum in Beijing, um, they particularly want to remind us as curator to engage a lot of like young generation audience. So we thought about why don't we just use digital, like create Xiao Qing's uh, original work into a digital artwork. So uh, I invited Victor Wong um, um, to work together. So we selected a group of works and then, and then uh, let Victor to recreate or reinterpret this um, this work, and then to uh, to set up an immersive room, and also to um, specially create a, a digital installation. So I found uh, this is a new life um, of uh, of an old artist who is now eighty something years old. Now his work become like to to a new new virtual world, a new dimension, and I love to see the response of the audience, especially um, the, the 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 young generation how they experience this un universal um, energy that the artist wanted to express or the artist wanted to uh, elaborate through, through the artwork. And that's why I think um, um, this, to me, I think digital work, not necessarily dig digital art, not necessarily have to be only digital, but could also be combining like digital and, 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 and um, I mean, original uh, craftsmanship um as well as the technology so um I, I i like to see how the digital or technology um rediscover or elaborate some aesthetic details of the original works and put this work into totally um a new experience so um so to me to me um especially when i work with victor for the tech inc i found um this is also very inspiring uh, to, to myself, to other artists as well, because we are talking about uh, to talk about how to use um, AI or technology to um, to to try to to review the brushstrokes and also the aesthetic quality of ink art. So I think this is very very interesting. When we talk about ink art, it's about atmospheric essence, spirituality, but how technology, how AI can share this uh, aspect um, with the artists and also with the audience. So I found um, I, I don't have a de definition of, of uh, digital art, but I like to I mean to continue to work with like 
digital and technology and with artists and also, um, I mean, uh, with the audience and also academic as well. Thank you very much, Kelvin. I think that those those themes, are, you know, are quite distinct from certainly what you was describing for us there, rather than creating an ambiguous space where you're mediating bits and bytes. Instead, you're, you're talking very much about, um, I suppose, the augmentation of an existing corpus of work and its revitalization, in what you described this, this new and virtual world and this new dimension, um, which I suppose is, it's another kind of end of the spectrum, if you will, from the kind of the, the, the original creation in a, in, a, in a digital space to the kind of the augmentation of of other objects and bringing them into a digital space where they kind of exist in dialogue with these, um, the, the, the kind of older objects and themes existing with, with newer technologies and, and modes of consumption, I suppose. Um, before kind of uh, turning back to, to Victor, Adrian, as a, as a kind of curator in a different kind of context, do you, do you feel that kind of revitalization and augmentation is, is part of what you would seek to do um, in engaging with the digital? Is that the, the main platform for you? Are you would you hope in, in kind of five, 10, 15 years, the RA is engagement with the digital is, is more immersive? You know, would you, do you see a different kind of direction here from this, this tension between the, the digital native, if you will, and the, the kind of the, the digital revitalization of, of existing traditions? Well, I, I think so, because, you know, technology is moving quickly uh, and advances, huge advances are being made in technology. Our biggest, I think our biggest challenge as a, you know, an institution that is pretty much reliant on a, a paying audience for our uh, well-being, financial well-being. We, we do need to, to have a movement of people through galleries. We need to charge people, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the biggest issues is how you do that in volume when you're working with digital, and in particular, the, the, the uh, virtual reality or augmented reality um, experience is something that we found very problematic because there's a lot of um you know the kind of engagement between people about how to use the technology what you to expect from the technology um so it's a kind of almost one-on-one -on -one basis so each person comes in you have to hand them a handset you then have to you know clean the handset or headset rather and you have to go through a process but you also have to explain to them what to expect and what to do so i mean i think what we would love to see is is that kind of cumbersome element of it already they're wireless I think some of these before they you know you have to trail a wire around now you've got the wireless technology but it's really the kind of um it's how you get people to interact with it that is the the the, the main obstacle for us I think and I would probably also add that the as you saw for you know that my slideshow I, I should have mentioned that the Tate Modigliani uh, element was something additional to an additional experience of the exhibition to try and recreate his studio which has obviously been lost so it's another sort of level of the experience of understanding the artist but when it's the artist's work itself that's more problematic and i think you know we have to find ways of of making it more accessible and easier and quicker for people to use and not feel so particularly in covid times when people are going to be very uh, cautious about using anything that covers their eyes or interacts with other people in that way you know we have to find a you know maybe we can have ordinary glasses that somehow can connect and, and allow you i mean it's, it can't be that far away i'm sure a lot of this technology and you know part of the problem is the cost of it so we also we need to see the cost of it coming down to make it more democratic and more accessible i think absolutely yeah i, I think those those kind of points about audience experience and that Again, we're coming back to this bodily dimension of you know putting something on your body and and, and interacting with things very very physically. We we can't seem to get away from that. Um, and I, yeah, that that comment on uh, that need to explain what to expect and what to do. The, the the familiarity, I suppose, of audiences with with the digital and that kind of maybe not un unease is the wrong word, but I suppose it depends uh, very much on on the context. That this is not yet firmly into the into the kind of the mainstream, the the, the wider consciousness. Digital is. Is, is a relatively nascent field, I suppose. I mean, although you point out we've had many examples of it in the RA's curation and exhibitions going back some time, but certainly the the the, the field seems to be changing and, and developing in, in many new and exciting ways. You know, with exemplified by the work of you and and, and Victor. Um, but with that kind of bodily dimension of interaction and, and audience reception in mind, I'd like to come come to you now, Victor, and ask, with particularly thinking about audiences, thinking about who consumes your art as a viewer, as a collector. Uh, as a gallery audience, whether online or in person, do, does the audience 
contribute to, to, to shaping what you define as the digital? I mean, do you, uh, do, does your, is your practice really informed by how it's to be received? You, are, you, are you thinking about the kind of the conceptual underpinnings of it and your relationship to the AI? Or are you very much involved in, in how the, the end product will be received? Um, so what's the, what's the relationship, I suppose, between creative process and audience reception in, in shaping your digital art practice? My all these things, uh, these two questions together. <laughs> now, uh, because um, first, um, how do I, how, wh how and why, and, and, and to create the digital artwork is, a, is a one question. And the other is that how the audience um, appreciate it? What, what media is? I think um, digital um, art is the kind of a media, just like, okay, you have papers, uh, uh, a pencil and paper, you have sculpture. You got to have the a right tools to do that, right? So I say, okay, you need the computer or electronics or projectors to work on um, digital art. So that is um, uh, one um, way of thinking it. And then uh, we have uh, like AR and then VR and all this kind of, it's just the output. It's just a container to contain your work. Uh, maybe the container itself now is not that um, sophisticated, but through times and technology developments, it will be more natural. Let me show you um, one slide and that um, uh, Kelvin's uh, talk about, uh, we have an experience on like uh, doing the artwork of uh, Master Selshin, uh, which is uh, he created a um, lot of um, symbolic pictures or icons and uh, way back uh, in the um, in the 30s. So um, uh, how it be um, put together, um, uh, his work in, in, in the new universe or in a, in a space that I can, um, today's um, youth or other people can appreciate, or even around the world, they can appreciate it, uh, uh, rather than just um, uh, look at the, the real stuff. Let me show you, you the screen of this. Yeah. So this is the, um, what you call the multi-universe. Um, uh, of his work, uh, I, we, we talk about like 20 pictures, um, paintings, with really, he um, uh, painted, and then we create from those paintings and uh, extract the elements, and then animate it, and it put into different scale, different screens, so people can walk around, people can take a look at the big screen or small one, or even we can focus on the details or his. Uh, or the, um, the intention of creating that paintings, let's say uh, the one that is um, have a sun in it. What is what is that? Uh, and and maybe the geometry he wanted to talk about. And we focus on the turning of the geometry or turning into different angles, and people can appreciate his work. And then uh, also we create another piece um, which put his um, work into a sculpture like this. This is an LED sculpture in an infinite. Um, uh, uh, shapes that um, his work talk about um, the universe in, in, in infinite. So um, I create this piece and put his work inside this infinite um, loop of um, screen that his work can, can turn into loops and forever. So that is something um, uh, put um, uh, 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 a physical uh, work into digital. And then you can uh, and have people appreciate it or even I can convert this into a VR that I can send it to uh, like uh, LA or Paris or someone just put on screen and, and appreciate it. Um, and also because now the rendering is not that sophisticated. You may find in some VR stuff, it's not really enough. But when, when just like movies in the past like 20 years, you see like fake rendering and up. now you see Avengers and all that is very realistic. So I think in a in a very near future, just like maybe one or two years, you may see the VR just as if it is like um, what you see in the reality. Um, uh, that is something I I would say this kind of of um, of uh, output, what you call a container, it is um, how you contain it um, uh, in in a, in a, in a way that um, uh, people can appreciate, the audience can can appreciate whatever it is, uh, let's, just like a just like movie. Movie is kind of artwork. You can, you can see your movie at home, you can see a theater or in different countries. So I think um, yeah, when, we talk, when you think about digital, it's something uh, you can instantly beam it to somewhere and, uh, and, 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 and instantly appreciate it rather than wait for like years or months to have the, the museums to circulate all this painting in the back. 
So this is somehow I think um, uh, with digital um, and more and people, more more audience can appreciate your work. So this is my opinion. Peter, thank you so much. I, I think that audience dimension is a, uh, is a certainly a key facet, and I, I really appreciate you kind of bringing in that that very strong case. That the definition of the digital is to some extent in the way it's consumed as well as the way it's produced. That you're you're, you're expanding this to show an artist like Xiao Qin. Um, being presented as as pixels, as as light on a, a moving image on a screen, um, and also that that very strong um, uh, case that you make, that very strong argument you make that in in your definition, in your approach to digital art, digital is about a kind of perhaps we could say democratizing, certainly an expanding of the ways that we consume this, so a, a, a mass, rapid, almost in instantaneous transfer of artworks from one location to another. Uh, but with that that in mind, and that kind of the, the implications that has for our consumption of artists as, as audiences, perhaps even as collectors, um, or, or, or even, you know, whether institutional collectors or individual collectors, I'd like to come back to you, Yun, and, and ask you maybe if you can talk a bit more about your, your work and its relationship to the physical body. Um, you commented, uh, not in this panel, but I think in other places, you've mentioned that you, you feel very strongly, um, or you certainly displayed very clearly to us the, the importance of a physical space in which your digital products are enacted, if you will. Um, so maybe you can talk a bit more about how, how and if your work could be transferred in the way that Victor is describing. Do, do your installation pieces need to be site specific in how they're consumed? And, and indeed, when we look at videos of them, and um, when we see the kind of these carefully shot and, and highly uh, you know, eloquently produced um, footage of your installation pieces, are we really experiencing your artwork or is, do we need to be in a physical space where our body is interacting with it in a multi-sensory context for it to, to kind of take on the meaning that you, you want it to have as the, the original maker? Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's a really important question. So um, as a practitioner, I think my work needs to be in the physical realm. So it, it's kind of a, so for me, I miss always my because once it's deinstalled, I cannot see them anymore. So it's really a temporal exhibition that exists in that particular time and space. And then I highly value that quality in my project. So I, a lot of time, I kind of highlighted the important dimensions in your work. We now have multiple dimensions. It's uh, physical reality, there's a virtual reality. In, in between them, there are multiple realities, augmented reality, augmented virtualities, mixed realities, whether to use VR, AR, MR. So it needs to be your own decision. And I strongly believe that concepts and your, the contents of your work needs to be go along with that dimension where you create your work. Does it have to be in the physical view? Does it have to be located in the virtual reality? Do you want your audiences has to be communicated through the VR device? So that's the reason I, at the moment, I don't know about my future, but at the moment, I don't want to be in my devices. I want my work needs to be intuitive as much as possible, as much of as possible. That's the reason I use a lot of technology example in the last video that I show you. I, I, in my few project, I have embraced AI technologies, but rather than using gun generations or stuff like that, I want to employ the technology as we use it in our daily life. So nobody can really learn it, whether I use AI technology or not because AI technology is already prevailing. We use it every time. When we drive the car, when we use a smartphone, it's already here living with us. I use machine visions to accurately position the viewer's position. I can generate images in real time. I use AI technologies in modern way, but in an unseen level. So I really, uh, I am more like a working architect or system engineer rather than conventional artists. I have to calculate the possible problems. I have to be um, study the floor plan. And um, along with that, the bodily experience of the audience is really important to me because I, I never, I really don't want to put the lengthy descriptions or manuals how to engage with the world you need to on and off and there could be more phone numbers. I personally, I don't, it needs to be there and it could be the international link to the little kids or the, the 
ladies like in their 70s or 80s it has to be clicked with anyone instantly so that's the reason why i really spend a lot of time in designing the pathway in my exhibition so if you remember there's a video in my in my presentation about the full dome um it's actually a 20 meters in diameter which is not among the space so in for that project i have spent a lot of time designing the entrance and exits this is a full dome projection it completely immersed me it, it, it really disorienting your perceptions so then should we have a single entrance and a single exit because the narrative actually it's quite spherical it's not linear anymore then why don't we have a different like a multiple entrance and exit so that people can you know, enjoy it on their own way. So for me, I spent, I studied the space, studied the engines, where should they come in? And then, then where are the images coming from? Is it coming from the ceiling towards the floor? Is it coming from the left or the right? That's the reason why I call them a spatial narrative rather than temporal linear or not. So um, yeah, but the, the reason why I spend lots of time to articulate all the engaging engagements of the audience is because I think that is the whole process lead them to think about it. Rather than, you know, the proscenium relationship with the screen and there's audience you have to sit from the beginning towards the end, but rather than they have to study their own orientation within the environments, they have to make their own pathways within the exhibition. So I kind of enjoying watching them in the dark area, how they react to my insulin. I know it sounds, maybe sounds spooky, but <laughs> because they, everybody has a different way to engage with it. Some people just really running away with it. They're just sitting on or but some of them are really passively just watching in front of the what whatever surface they face. So yeah, that's the reason why I really enjoy um, the whole technical, let's say, crazy um, process because I wish my work would make it immerse to be immersed and think and reflex for a while. So Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think it's amazing to think about the, the numerous different spaces that you've worked in, from kind of Zara Hadid's um, architectural in, spaces in, in Seoul to mm -hmm. V&A's cast courts to many other kind of spaces besides. So I think that kind of that interaction between your work and the space is a, a, a really interesting dimension to hear more about. And, and, in, and in many ways, in kind of in contrast, perhaps in complement to, to Victor's description of a kind of uh, a digital immediacy that can be kind of beamed from California to Hong Kong to Seoul to London in, in, in seconds, which is very different ends of a spectrum, but a, a shared process. And I think also the, the way that you spoke at the end, that kind of cognitive engagement perhaps reflects back on the kind of thinking digitally that, um, that Victor was talking about in his own process. And, and perhaps we should also think digitally as audiences as well. That's something we need to learn to do to kind of catch up with the artists who are, who are making these works. Again, Adrian's comments that we need to kind of explain what to expect and what to do when you go into these spaces. So as, as we learn to think digitally, perhaps we'll, we'll engage more intuitively and more readily with this, um, uh, the kind of work that Yi Yun and, and Victor are making. So then as a, as a final question um, to, to all of you, um, I, I'd like to, Kind of shift our focus perhaps less to the the consumption in the gallery space or with the creative process but the kind of the afterlives of, of these products and, and products and how they are how they are consumed and sustained i mean we've, we've talked a lot about materiality and immateriality and you know in the title of our our panel today is is creating curating but also collecting digital art so uh, Yiyun, perhaps you can start first. I mean, is it possible to collect these very site-specific works that you create, or do you do you deliberately want to create something that is is a commission rather than a, a collectible item? Can can someone own your work, um, an institution or even an individual? Yeah, that's a good. Well, I know that the reason why Malcolm asked me because uh, we worked together while I was doing a residence at the VNA, the first uh, yeah. I shared today. And after the exhibition, the creators of the VNA quite liked the idea of the only reinterpretations of the, the, uh, the VNA's cast court. So they decided to uh, acquire my ephemeral site specific <laughs> prepping installation. So of course I would love to, it's an honor, but actually we spent a year to discuss how we can actually collect it, 
how can we do that? How we can even do it? So it was it was actually more productive process than my own PhD, to be honest. So <laughs> the Rosalie at the time, part of the the creator uh, who decided to acquire my my work, we decided we talked a lot of discussions, a lot of questions and answers. How do we acquire this one? Is it possible? Is it the proper way, optimal way to buy the digital files alone? Does it make it you know a, a really a tangible method to preserve your content and the physical installations at the same time? So after a year of discussion, we decided to acquire a package from my analog drawing, like um, analog physical model to the digital models, digital rendering files, digital sounds, and even the documentation of my installation. So the list of the, the material that I've submitted to the VNA is like um, 500 or something, <laughs> like a multiple. And even over the, over the course of acquisition, me and Malcolm and the creator of the VNA, we had a workshop. So I actually, I taught them how to use Project Bank. It was really, really interesting day for me because all of the creators sitting in front of me, I was like teaching, this is a projection mapping, this is how you um, put your file through the projector towards the three-dimensional sculptures in a massive scale. We studied them together because we have to prepare the technical obsolescence of medium, the hardware, the software. So I think as a leading artist who live in the 21st century, who work in digital, who using digital technologies in some way, we have to prepare. We think we need to think about the technical obsolescence. What if this particular model is not being produced anymore? How can I replace it with different technologies, different methods, software and hardware? So that's the reason I spend lots of time in making my text writer. This is the specification that I need for now, but in the future, this is, this is, this is blah, 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 blah. So I know that the, the Namjoon Pak, the uh, most, the, one of the most important video artists, the first generation, um, they, the, the Namjoon Pak Museum in Korea, Namjoon Pak Foundations, and even what's a Smithsonian Museum in, in, in the United States, they have a particular team who travels all the world to collect that particular TV screen. So we, it's, we cannot um, avoid it anymore. We have to think about it as a practitioner, as a researcher, a creator of such a big institution. So yes, my, my answer is of course, yes. I think that the, uh, I, the, the whole platform is rapidly changing. I think that someone will talk about, maybe Kevin will talk about the NFT. So the whole market is, rapidly changing and i'm currently i'm developing a project with our tech house maybe some of you know in in uh in um, washington miami and, and new york and i'm developing a project with super blue it's run by Henry. so the the established galleries or the new platforms are emerging rapidly so the whole ecosystem of digital arts is changing and you know for example the the consumers of the uh, nfts are they are completely from the traditional collectors they have different philosophy they have different cults so we never know what will happen but as a practitioner who works in this industry i'm really happy to see what's coming and then um yeah so i believe that i personally i haven't started to produce any NFTs or metaverse, because again, I cannot really shift medium instantly. For me, I have to find wow. reasons of doing it. I have to study the medium, I have to start the platform, I have to learn my own way to you know, implement the technology into my work. So it may take time for me, but I definitely love to do it. So yeah, that would be the answer. So I think there is interesting and bright. <laughs> That, that's a great note to finish on, a, a bright and interesting future. And, mm -hmm. and I think that that, uh, that kind of dedication to the media, but um, the, the challenges you outlined, you know, really, again, are showing that kind of that, that stage that we're still at that to kind of perpetuate and, and uh, archive this material. We, we need the physical as well as the digital. 
Um, and with that kind of duality in, in mind, um, maybe uh, Victor first, but also Calvin, you could speak to how specifically the AI Gemini project is, is consumed by collectors. You know, when, when someone buys one of those ink paintings, do they own a piece of the process in some way? Do you have a way of encoding that in it? Or is there, do you, is that where your kind of work as a, as a curator and, and a, a Calvin and as, a, a, as a, an artist, Victor, is to kind of, to, to ensure that there is visibility or kind of understanding amongst the collectors is what the process behind the work was, but they only, they possess the kind of this end output, this kind of, um, how did you describe them as Victor? You, yeah, you, you described them as, you said they were only a container, um, but are the, do you embed the process in some way in these these ink paintings or, or are are they receiving kind of the, the 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 traces if you will to use the kind of the term that classical chinese used for yeah uh, referring to calligraphy and ink work so how, how well, is your I, I i i sometimes uh well almost most of the time i would like um uh, put a time-lapse camera um to uh take down the process of like 50 hours of paintings uh, because gemini may took 20 to 50 hours of painting so um and also sometimes i i, I would do like um uh, editing a very short piece around like maybe 30 seconds about his making of kind of mm -hmm. a, a gift to <laughs> to the to the collectors that uh oh this piece you can uh, take a look how it's produced and i think it's not just a process it's, it's about um, to make him understood, uh, this is a piece that is not just by human. Uh, and also, uh, they, they really like to see how Gemini's work, um, uh, how, 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 how those ink and uh, with the robots and uh, how they put on the paper. So that is something they, they want to know. And also because of this, um, and, and Kelvin, um, uh, we have a very good experience with, uh, with collectors that uh, they not just um, because it's AI, it's not just because it's special, because because of aesthetic, because they love the pictures. Just like um, some, you buy the picture because you love it or you like it. Just just uh, as a normal collectors, um, I think that's one part. Uh, yes, you can talk about this, uh, Kelvin. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I, I think um, as a gallerist, um, when we work with the artists, uh, I always think uh, that the, the end result um, is um, the works being collected by collectors. So it's, I think it's a part of the ecology of the whole art industry, right? And also um, being collected means um, financially, uh, the artists and the galleries have the support Then we can continue to explore and to continue our journey. And also through 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 this process, I will see um, the collecting and cons on consuming consumption. So, for example, when we work with museum, so uh, we create this immersive or digital um, experience. Um, we don't necessarily think in a commercial way. We also want to create a dialogue, create an experience, and to let the artist to I mean to um, to demonstrate the, the division and also to uh, allow the artists to demonstrate their creativity and through through some collaboration with museum, for example. So I think this is also the way that we need to support the artists to build um, their credential and also to have to have this uh, particular project documented. So documentation is also a part of the process that I think is very important. That's why when I particularly work with uh, Victor. We also thought we, we uh, I, I, I will think through the whole process. After Victor has the idea, so we will work together to discuss how we present it in the market um, through the uh, exhibitions, through maybe collaboration with commercial or academic world, and how we document this um, in the process and how we want to also share this with the collectors. Eventually, I think um, when audience come to see the, see, see, see the works, if they have the opportunity to bring them home to collect, I think this is also very fulfilling. And also we can also build up your audience space, very actual audience space. So, so I, always, I always try to strike a balance um, I always remind Victor, for example, we are now at, actually having a new project with the AI Gemini's um, um, a new new creations. We also always remind ourselves not to make it over the commercial. 
we have the idea, we have the concept, we have this theme, then we just have a have have have, have a controlled quantity so that we can allow um, collectors from around the world to also to to share this um, uh, this um, I mean uh, this whole process. But at the same time, I think throughout this process, we can also have the have the whole like a uh, whole journey of um, documenting it through uh, what what Victor said, um, visual documentation and also written documentation. And finally, is size of uh, size of specific is to have the exhibition and demonstrate uh, presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Robert. I think that. Uh, one more thing. Let me, let me, let me, I just, I just come in with my, my idea. Oh, I need to say that because I come back to the afterlife question. Um, talk about this uh, when you create uh, a digital art piece and then come back afterlife. I'm just thinking about um, that is the 1.0. I mean, you can upgrade your artwork. <laughs> that means that two years, two years later, you can find out your artwork 1.0 and upgrade it to 2.0 and let the collectors to collect it again. I, just like the software that you have like Photoshop 5.0 and now we have Photoshop 6.0, whatever. But the digital artwork, maybe they can like this kind of, like you continuous to upgrade it. I don't know. <laughs> this is just came up in my, in my head. I just want to say it out. <laughs> and also what uh, you and said, uh, now the NFT also provides uh, a new platform for artists not necessarily just a pure digital artist, but also like artist artists uh, to also make use of the platform to go to another, I mean, another new, um, another new dimension as well. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Kevin. I mean, I was uh, going to ask a, a kind of follow up question about the, the tension between sort of immersive experience in a gallery and and the, the possibility of how private collectors might own these things. But I think Victor's point is much more opposite. And the suggestion of um, uh, artwork 2.0, you know, uh, the, the kind of the iterations, multiplicities, and this, this change in how we think about that digital thinking, as, as Victor so deftly put it, about what an artwork is and how we might engage with it or consume it. Um, can I turn his suggestion to you, Yi Yun? Would you, would you consider kind of version 2.0, 3.0 of any of your prior works? Or do you, do you very much see them as discrete, contained and complete and, and not something to be revisited and, and kind of re, reformed in that sense? Could, could you create a casting 2.0 or a, a kind of proximity bubble 2.0? Uh, what would that entail? I think that's doable. But again, the, the, for me, that the most important thing all the time is the concept. We could discuss about this issue actually quite before when we talked about the acquisition process. Because uh, the creator asked me, hey, Ian, for example, I mean, in the video, you might figure that there is a trans column, like a massive column that is actually located in Rome. So I projected my behalf of the trans casts. So what if, what if I have one day become a, Art, a famous artist. So the the city of Rome invited me over to project with the same video on top of the trans column, the real one. Then would would it be the same cast or not? Would it be the same work or not? So the answer is definitely no, because the context is different, entirely different. My work is a, a, it can be only called casting under the context of the VNA's cast work. So that the transitions of whatnot is definitely possible. I can translate right. work in the VR or the AR. However, it has to be reconsidered whether I maintain my concept in a completely same way or should I revisit it again? Then maybe I need to adjust the content as well, even the soundscape. So as a digital artist, because it's it's all it's really different for me to be honest. I have never I am put my solo exhibition in the gallery will open in two weeks. So I'm going messy right now, but that is my solo exhibition in the gallery text in six years. So in the past six years, I have a lot of projects in Venice Architects Biennale, lots of Biennales, lots of museum exhibitions. I even work with BTS, but in a really different context from the gallery, let's say. So it's actually, it's already changing. There's a lot of different opportunities, lots of different 
um, let's say marketplace, <laughs> whatever that is, institutional chances or commercial chances that because as, as I think it's really Adrian mentions about the what about the at museum as a museum, a huge institution, it's not easy to promote or um, digital art or budgeting them. So that that be if we need to really think about the relationship between the uh, the the digital art experiences, the receptions of it, and the recirculations of it, with close proximity to the the market, where's the money comes from, blah blah blah. So I think that's I'm not saying that it's negative quality of digital or immersive art, but that it's a whole new dimension which makes the digital art even more interesting. So, but again, for me, um, sorry, I, maybe I'm saying, so, yeah, that would be my answer. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, I mean, it's amazing to hear you say kind of the, the first, uh, really interesting to think about that this is the first occasion in six years that you, you know, you're saying your, your more recent projects are working with kind of K-pop superstars rather than a gallery space. And I think that says something about the kinds of, interactions that are facilitated, the, the way that you are expanding our fields um, of, of, you know, so, expanding the field of, of uh, digital. If I can, yeah. Yeah. If I can ask a bit more about, about the last project with the BTS, it's actually, it's, uh, it connects five different cities in global projects. It, so um, for me, it was, it's really a um, living entity kind of project rather than one project in a one city or one museum. So at Serpentine Gallery in London, Martin Gropius Bar in Berlin, Thomas Araceno's flooding in Buenos Aires, and Anthony Gomley in New York. So it's kind of in me in Seoul. So I believe that institutions and galleries and organizations, it's rapidly reacting to it as well. So there will be more and more opportunities, more and more immersive experiences. I'm not just about the digital, but you know, massive um right engaging kind of installation rather than static one so yeah that that was um, people some people find hard to, to find what's the connection between bts and contemporary art but it's just quite interesting in, in, in a dynamic project thank you thank you very much Ian. um i think with that kind of final um framing if you will that that international connectivity multiple sites multiple artists agents and so on and and the the connectivity that you're describing between institutions um is is a really resonant note to kind of to 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 approach a close on but i'd like to turn to adrian then perhaps for our final comment what what do you think the um of those kinds of projects that kind of collaborative nature i mean the ra is such an august institution with its long history and as you said you know you you framed it at first you have three physical galleries in which you hold your exhibitions that's a very defined physical space in which things are experienced but do you do you see digital and collaboration with digital artists as opening up not only new kinds of work that you can create curate within your galleries but as a way that the ra's doors cease to be its limitations, if you will, that do, does the digital open up new kinds of international collaboration, perhaps along the lines of the project that you is describing is, is that something waiting in the wings for, for you at the RA? Or is this something you're, you're not yet quite, you're not quite there yet, or not quite heading in that direction? I would say we're probably not quite there yet. But it's certainly a very interesting uh, avenue to explore the idea of that, that kind of collaborative process. But I think it's also worth notes, noting that, you know, you might come to the RA to see uh, Anthony Gormley or, you know, a year or so ago, we had the big Anthony Gormley show. And, and what you're seeing are very, is a very tangible, you know, uh, sculptural pieces in front of you, some of which you can walk through, some of which you, you just stand and admire and what have you. But, you know, in the studio, there's a huge amount of digital work that goes on in creating those works in and in, in, in the fabrication of those works in the rendering of those works in the kind of so there's a there's a and, and Anish Kapoor likewise you know he's done work with with robotics and stuff and there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that artists are engaged with but when you actually look at their work it feels very different and distinct from the digital world so I think there's a blurring there that's quite interesting as well um 
But I think, you know, the RA is also an institution that has a body of Royal Academicians. Um, and as technology changes and as art develops and continues to develop and so on, inevitably we will have um, mem members of the Royal Academy who are uh, digital artists. And I think in very much the same way, we, we have a, a, a schools, uh, which is perhaps not the, you know, the front facing part of the Royal Academy, but we do have a postgraduate kind of uh, course for fine art students. And, you know, digital is very much part of what they're doing. So um, it is it is happening. It's just we, I think from from an audience perspective and how we integrate it into our temporary exhibition, that's that's the kind of the bit that we have to overcome, the bit that we have to understand better and and um, and, and make uh, and integrate, but it is happening. I think that's the, the important thing is that, you know, what we, what you see is often looks very conventional, but could be the result of a very digital process. On the other hand, you might see something that you would never confuse with anything but a digital work, you know, um, and should we make, ultimately, should we be making the distinction? Yeah, thank you very much, Adrian. I think that's that's the note I'd like to finish our, our kind of formalized discussion on here. That that question that seems to we keep coming back to is is not just about materiality or immateriality, um, not even just about process, but very much about cognition, cognition in the creation and in the reception. As as Victor definitely put it, it's it's about thinking digitally, um, both in how we um, how, how artists like Victor and Yi Yun create our work, but also how we curate and even receive it as audience members. So that. That I think is where we'll we'll close today on. So thank you so much to um, to Yi Yun, to Calvin, uh, to Adrian, and to Victor for your very rich, varied, and distinctive perspectives you've brought to this this collective discussion around uh, creating, curating, and uh, and collecting digital art. And uh, we look forward to um, uh, to finding ways to collaborate with you all again in the future. Take care.